originally you can sit down. Originally I was supposed to speak last Sunday and my wife told me I couldn't <laughs> because the day before was uh, our youngest son getting married. And uh, so I spoke the morning before my son's wedding and uh, which my daughter-in-law was appalled at, but she'll soon realize that she has no control over anything involving my life. <laughs> and I will have a measure of control of what happens in her life. That's not true. But she was like, you're speaking the day of my wedding? I'm like, uh, yeah, you're gonna be sleeping? I'm gonna be speaking. But I'm glad I didn't speak the next day because the next day I felt like a, no offense if this is offensive to anyone, but I felt like a junior high girl on the verge of tears all day long. And uh, I, I was like a, a good dad that, that on the wedding day, you simply ask, what time am I supposed to be there? And they tell you, and what am I supposed to wear? And they tell you, and a good dad just wears the right thing and shows up on time. And so I did, and I felt like a good dad. And then I experienced so many things that day that was so moving to me. <clears throat> Sitting there in the groomsmen room, about 30 minutes before the ceremony, it was just me and Andrew was over there just doing whatever he's doing, reading something, and he walked over and he said, Dad, will you read me the Bible? And he handed me his Bible, and he said, read my favorite book, which is Hosea, ironically, where God asks a man to marry a harlot. It was very moving. <laughs> but I'm reading his Bible, and I see around the edges the notes he's taken from the studies he's done of God's holy word. You know what that does in a man? when he sees that his son has been scribbling in scripture. And then to do my next part of the ceremony, which is walk down the aisle with my wife and take a seat. It's so humbling in a moment like that to be able to hold the arm of a woman that's chosen to love you for 29 years. And you know that at least in 33% of that time, you've been a jack wagon. And yet there she is, and she wants to hold my arm. It's so humbling. It's so humbling. No man is ever so great that's like, I am such an awesome man that my wife can't help but to cling to me. That's the story of no man. And then to sit there as the ceremony begins, and here comes my son, and the pastor and they're standing there and I'm just, I'm just feet from them. And I, I'm just, the first person down the aisle is my oldest son, Matthew, sitting over here. And to, what it does to a man when he sees his oldest son stop at the altar and embrace his brother with a love that you know comes from a real place, to know that your two sons love each other so deeply. And then to watch my daughter come down the aisle and there's that same embrace. And then to, to just be a participant in their ceremony and then not knowing, you know, they wrote their own vows and and then you're sitting there and your son proclaims the gospel message in the vows he's given to his wife. It wrecks a man. Is this being recorded? <laughs> <clears throat> and then to go to the reception and be excited about this pulled pork and these instant mashed potatoes and and then to sit there as they do these dances, and then there's this, you know, there's this dance where my son who just got married does a dance with my wife. 
And to watch the two of them, I'll never forget the picture in my mind, that the entire song, they were just locked eye to eye and in, 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 engrossed in conversation. They were engrossed in conversation the whole time. The depth of their relationship. I was so moved. Jealous that I couldn't dance with someone. Also jealous that I can't dance at all. <laughs> As you listen to that story, you might make the mistake of thinking, he is such an awesome man that he got to experience those things. That is not the story. There's no such thing as an awesome man. I wasn't such a great father that these things happened. I wasn't such a great man that my wife loves me as she does. I have simply, imperfectly, followed a faithful God. The results of our life don't come from our power, some kind of talent we have. I didn't, there was nothing I did that caused my son to read the Bible and study it. It wasn't like something, some plan I had, I'm going to plan and control. I'm going to get my kids to love the Bible and they're going to study it and write notes in the edges of it. And I've got this perfect plan, three steps to cause your wife to always adore you even when you're a jack wagon. Five steps to cause your kids to grow up and love each other. That's not the story. I wanted to come speak and be so professional today. And then someone chose to sing How Great Thou Art. And I gotta tell you something, the story of my life, none of it is how great I was. It's how great he is. And some of you, you're looking at your life and you heard the moments I had in my life and you're like, I want to have them in my life or I don't think I'll ever get to have those in my life. Maybe you have relationships with people in your life that have been broken. And you're like, I'm so inspired that you got to have that, but I don't get to. Who said your story's over? I promise there were messy moments with my son, Andrew. And at least half the time it was his fault. I promise there were messy moments with, between me and my wife. And at least 10% of the time it was her fault. At least. Is there someone here today that you have a mess in your life or in a relationship and you've decided that it's outside of the love of God to be able to redeem? Have you decided there's something that's happened that's outside of the power of God? Can I tell you, the, uglier, the more ugly your story has been, the more great our God can be in the middle of it. I think the, I think the greatest pain of all I'm going to draw a little picture. I think the greatest pain in life is the pain of my life will never be what it was meant to be. I think that's the greatest pain. It's like a silent pain because you can't really complain to anyone about that. Like if you have some kind of sickness and you tell someone, hey, I'm sick, and they're like, they have sympathy for you. It's kind of hard to tell someone, you know, I hate that my life will never be what it was supposed to be. It's hard to communicate that. But I'm convinced that that is the heart behind depression, anxiety, suicide. Is that when people lay their head on the pillow at the end of the night, they can't sleep because of the great pain that I will never be what I was meant to be. I think it's the greatest pain a human can have. Life is really pretty simple. We're born, 
And we're born for a purpose. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he planned in advance for you to do. We are the workmanship of God. If you want to look at life at the most simplest of ways, imagine a four-year-old boy who gets out of the bathtub and he dries himself off and he has this moment in his nakedness, in his simplicity, he looks at this towel and he imagines how much greater it can be. And he ties it around his neck as a cape. No one teaches him this. It's just instinctual. It's instinctual for a human being to look in the mirror and think, I am made for something. I am made for something. There's a man in Germany who two months ago was struggling with his purpose and meaning in life. He struggles with it every three or four months. And he stumbled across one of my YouTube videos about purpose. And so he reached out to me and he went through my, the Purpose Mastermind program I do. I don't talk about God with someone like that. I let them talk to God. I let them talk to me about God. And three weeks in, this man from Germany, he said, this thing in me that, that my life is supposed to be something more, was it put there by God? Well, let's talk about that. Were you ever that four-year-old boy looking in the mirror and you're raising up your arms that have no muscle, no, and you just like, but you look in your eyes. You're not thinking about what you'd look like. You think about what you're made for. Life has a way of making us forget what we're made for and only think about what we look like. Life has a way of making us forget what we were made for and only think about what we look like. What do they think of me? How does my body look? What's my reputation? Do I look impressive to people? Will they like me? Will they accept me? When I look at life in simplicity, we're born and inside of us is this innate thing. Ephesians 2.10, I'm the workmanship of God. I'm created to do something in this world. I like to use the word purpose. It brings such meaning. But today what I want to talk about, I want to talk about three prison cells that trap us outside of the purpose we were made for. Three things that prevent us from living with the cape on. Three things that keep us from pursuing our purpose and instead we're just like locked in a prison outside of the life where we're dreamed we, we were made for. Have you ever felt that way? You ever felt like the life that you were meant for, you're like locked out of it? The first one, these first two I'm going to talk about very briefly. The first one is trying to perfect your life. Trying to perfect your life. Where you measure your life more by how great your daily devotions are than you do measure your life by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Perfecting your life, well, man, my devotions are really good, so I'm going to be really, so today's going to be great. But if my devotions aren't good today, then today may not go so well. Trying to perfect our life, where we, we're always judging our life. You ever come across Christians that judge their life by their actions and their like Christian conducts? instead of gauging their life by the power of Christ at work in us. Here's why I think we try to perfect our life. I think it's because we're trying to control our life because we don't trust God with the results. You know, to trust God with your life is not just trusting God with the results. 
Trusting God with your life is when you don't even decide the results. I'm going to say it again. Trusting God is not just trusting God with the results of your life. Trusting God, you trust him to the point that you don't even decide the results. Who are we as humans to be like, okay, this is what the results of my life should be. As if somehow we can make those happen. As if somehow our life would be better if we knew the end result. Okay, God, now that I know the end result, I can work with you and make this happen. And God's like, oh, really? (laughs) Really? Like you knowing the result is somehow going to make it better for you to work with me on where this is going. God's like, "How how about you just put down the reins and let me steer this thing? Why, why do we try to control our life? Is it because we're afraid it's not going to work out? Is it because we're afraid it's not going to work out? What if you could move on from that fear? What if, that your, best, what if your best life in God is letting go of control the results so you can follow him boldly? Let's go to the second thing. The second prison that can keep us off this path of purpose is trying to fix our past. Trying to fix our past. I'm going quick on this one. I think there's two ways that we can stay stuck in our past. One is by hiding it. Listen, if you hide your past, that is your statement of faith that nothing good can come from it except except for me hiding it. Hiding your past is your statement of faith that nothing good can come from it. My only choice is to hide it. When you hide your past, you're not just concealing it from people. It doesn't even matter. Like Everyone doesn't even know your past. But when you're hiding your past, you're telling God, what happened to me cannot be redeemed. And God wants to use the worst of what life has brought your way for his glory in your future. Human instinct is, I need to do something amazing to move forward in life. That's not scripture. Scripture, the pathway to fruitfulness, is oftentimes these counterintuitive things, like facing your weakness. So the first way our our, our past holds us in a prison is when we hide it. But the second way that our past holds us back is when we become a student of it. I need to go back in time and like, I need to figure it all out. I got to sort out my whole past. I got to connect all the dots between my past and who I am today. I need to understand my past. I need to study it. So it's like two ditches, right? On one side, it's hiding it. And the other side, the other ditch is I become a student of my past. Instead of being excited about my future, I'm trying to somehow clean up my past. Fix it. Sort it all out. Let's go to the third one. I'm going to spend the bulk of the time on this one. This prison is I need to fix my problem before I can live my life. I need to fix my problem before I can get to my life. And I want to demonstrate this to you. Because for most of my adult life, I felt like I was, I felt like I was in a prison. And right outside the prison was my purpose. I'm going to use these boxing gloves for my purpose. This, uh, I was meant to be in the fight. But I felt like I was locked out of the purpose of my life. And so I want to demonstrate what it was like being in this prison cell. I brought a friend with me today because he's the friend I have that's most likely to have been in prison before. <laughs> 
and uh, so here's our prison cell, okay? Here's our prison cell. Here's this prison door. And, and right here is my purpose that I'm locked out of. So in this prison cell, it, it was kind of like this. I just, I just have to fix my problem so that so I can have my purpose. Once I fix my problem, I'll have my purpose. You're going to lose the weight, then we'll walk out of here. Lose the weight, then we'll get out of here. You makes, it makes total sense. See, I used to weigh almost 400 pounds. Now I weigh almost 300. Just over. <laughs> Just to be honest. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the thought, that lie right there, I have to fix my problem, then I can have my purpose. It felt righteous to me to really like beat myself up about this. Like the more, the more I, I get ashamed, the more guilty I feel, the more like the more I'm hard on myself, like I am, I am so bad for having a problem with food. I'm such a, I'm, this is so wrong. It felt like the harder I get on myself, the more likely it is that I'll get free from this problem. Look at you. I mean, really, you really are a disappointment. It is very hard to walk with Christ when the recurring theme of your thinking is that your life is a disappointment and it can't stop being a disappointment until your problem changes. I'll say it again. It is very difficult to walk in your freedom in Christ when your thinking is, I can't be free until I fix my problem. My life is a disappointment until I fix my problem. It almost feels righteous to think that way. Like, is it okay for me to go and, and be what God's called me to be when I'm in this condition? Fix this problem. Here's how we're going to fix this problem. We're going to get some diet books. Look at this. I found this. <laughs> How to do keto and look neato. Come on. So, listen, so, so frustrating. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no you, no, you hang on. Eat cake and look great. This is here. You got this. We're going to do this. Dan Marino lost 35 pounds. Dan Marino. Eh? Come on, we got this. So, so one of these will work? Yeah, of course it will. If diet books work, why are there thousands of them? We'll get a gym membership. That's what we'll do. Lifetime. $135. Look here. Let me tell you about the time I went to the gym. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, there Just a second. There weren't many times I went to the gym. But I went one time because a guy had a free offer for... 30 minutes of free training. I'm like, this was about every four years, I worked up the guts to get help. But I got the wrong kind of help. So I went to this guy and he was giving me 30 minutes of training. And he said, go over here. And he said, I want you to sit on the floor and get up 10 times. And I did it. And I was like, is he trying to make me feel stupid and more ashamed? Is he trying to make me look, is he trying to make me realize how bad my problem is? I gotta be honest, at the time, sitting down on the floor and getting up 10 times was actually difficult. Now, if I was the man I was now that I was then, he would have had a barbell implanted in the side of his head. <laughs> I look back at that and I'm like, was he trying to make me feel so ridiculous about my problem that I would sign up to let him help me? Wait a that minute. That man can't help me. Just a second. We forgot about this. Bowflex. 
revolution. The Bowflex revolution. 2,800 bucks. See that six pack right there? You see that guy? That's you after the first payment. We got this. Come on. After the first payment? Yeah. Can I tell you, and maybe you know how frustrating it is to feel like you were meant to be doing something with your life, but you can't. I remember being about 12 years old and having a paper route. My goal in life, even from the youngest of ages, was to simply be a person that helped people. When I had that paper out at Christmas time, I made cookies and gave them to my customers. When I was a teenager, I learned how to make things out of wood and I'd make little craft things and give them to people that I loved. That's the kind of life I wanted to live. But then life put me in this prison. Or maybe I put myself in this prison, not by my problem, but by how I thought about my problem. That until I fix this problem, I can't be that man. The burden of that. The burden of the only thing I wanted to be in this world, I could never be in this world. That's a good reason to need to eat food. You're getting worked up. Please, you need to calm down. You know how you get. You're stressed out. Shh, 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 shh. I got an idea. This always makes us feel better. Hang on. Open that one. Little Debbie. So good. Mm. Mm. The yeah. harlot of my life. Yeah. One You're more. You, you, You're okay you, now. You got enough for the weekend? I do. We can deal with this Monday. Right there. Be fine. Then we'll worry about getting out of here. Just relax. Shh, 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 shh. It's okay. You're all right. <clears throat> this must be what like communion in hell is like. <laughs> you got a point there. where you're comforted by the thing that put you in the prison to begin with. I could tell you, I think drug use makes all the sense in the world. When a human being thinks that the only thing they were meant for they can never be, how do you not need to numb that pain with something? Alcoholism makes all the sense in the world. When you think the only thing you were meant to be, you cannot be. You need something to numb the pain of that. You know, there's a movie called Braveheart. And just like the little four-year-old boy with a towel, that movie represents so much of the life I wanted to live. William Wallace is this powerful dude and face painted and he's got a sword in a cool kilt, he's on a horse, and there's all these men in front of him. And they've got their face painted and the swords and the kilts and the horses. And it's like, I just want to be in that line of men. <laughs> How are you going to do that? They don't make a kilt that big. It's okay. <laughs> so, if I, so if I change my problem, I get my kilt. If I change my problem, I get my kilt. If I change my problem, then I can paint my face, have a sword, ride a horse, and wear a kilt. The thought that once I change my problem, I can be that person gives the person the perfect need to cope. 
The pain that my life can't be what it was meant to be will drive a person to anything to numb the pain. You know what our world tells people? Just stop eating little Debbie oatmeal cream pies. But what if it's the only time in my prison cell I feel good? How will I stop? What the world tells people, you need to stop drinking. Well, what if it's the only moment in my day I don't feel like killing myself? How do I do that? We tell our 15-year-olds, you need to stop gaming. You're wasting your life. The 15-year-old is thinking, you know what, Dad? I think my life is a waste. And the only time I feel like I like me is when I'm playing this game and winning every now and then. So all the focus by our culture and ourself, which is worst of all, is that I just need to fix my problem and then I can have my life. You're not ready. You deserve to be in jail here. Stay right here. How are you going to serve God? Look at you. You're not ready. Stay here. Yeah, it's wrong to think that God can use you when you have a problem, isn't it? How dare you think that God can use you when you haven't fixed your problem? How dare you think that you can live out your purpose when you haven't cleaned up your life enough? You know, there was a third person in my life all the time, right outside the prison door. I couldn't look at that person. It, it was Jesus, but I couldn't look at him because I assumed that Jesus was like the prison warden waiting for me to clean up my act so he could set me free. He was a parole officer at best. I couldn't look at him. The shame of looking at my life and being like, how can, how can I have done this to me? Why am I letting little Debbie oatmeal cream pies bring down my life and destroy me? Why can't I stop drinking? Why can't I stop smoking? Why can't I stop spending money? Why can't I stop watching this stuff? Why can't I, in the shame of it, you could, you could never look up. Can I tell you something that changed my life? When I finally got honest about me instead of hiding me. Because human instinct is, it doesn't matter how bad that, that prison is, human instinct is to dress up the prison so people at least have a better reputation of you. Human instinct is to dress up our prison so when people come on, prison, on, on visiting hours, they don't realize the prison we're in. And we just smile. Oh, I'm good. So good. When I became honest, and can, I, can I tell you a, a key to being honest with God about who you are? Is being honest with another human being. I called a guy one day. I didn't know him. He used to weigh over 300 pounds. He went down to 175, and I'm like, I'm going to call him. You know why I called him? It wasn't because I wanted to be skinny. It's because I wanted to be free. The problem you have, the goal of your life is not to not have that problem. The goal of your life is that you be free, which will cause you to have power over the problem. But there is no power where there is no freedom. When I was finally honest with myself, it made me look at my life completely differently. I saw everything differently. When you are hiding yourself, life makes no sense. People make no sense. And you make no sense to people. But when you come out of hiding, the perspective totally changes. I, f I finally had the guts to, to look up at the outside of the prison door. And I realized that what Jesus was saying 
was not, hey, you need to fix that so I can use you. Jesus was saying, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But wait. He we got to have the cookies. Come snuggle he with was little saying, Debbie. He was saying to me, I am the author and finisher of your faith. He wasn't saying, you've blown it too much. He was saying, I am the great high priest who sympathizes with you in your weaknesses to provide a throne of grace to help in time of need. He was saying, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. There is a life to be had that can cause someone to be set free from all the trappings. And when, when, I, when I came out of hiding and was honest about me, and being honest with a human helped me be honest with God. And I realized the gospel was compelling me. See if the door is unlocked. See if it's unlocked. And in my mind, I just, I just, at that time I was doing boxing workouts. Because it's amazing when you get freedom, you start pursuing your purpose instead of trying to fix your problem. I'll say it again. When you get freedom, you start pursuing your purpose and start of, instead of trying to fix your problem. I, compel, I was just compelled that the gospel was, why don't you see if that door is unlocked? And in my mind, I was, I was taking these steps towards this door and it was so scary. It was so scary because like if this door is locked, then I do have to fix my problem before I can live my purpose. In my mind, I went to that door and it was just so clear to me I just barely touched it. And it's like the hinges were old with grace. And the door just swung open. And I took one step out and I looked this way and this way. And there was no one to push me back in. No one. And so I ran. But I didn't run to lose weight. I ran because I was free. You can't run in a prison cell surrounded by mashed potatoes, no milk, cream pies. But when freedom comes, then life changes. Sometimes our righteous thinking is that I got to fix me first. And the whole time Jesus is like, I didn't come to fix you. I came to set you free. And with freedom comes change. If you're in this room today, I know that your life is not perfect. You're a human. If you're in this room today, I know that your life is made for purpose. And I know that there are things that have come against you to tell you, you don't get to have your purpose because of Jesus came to set you free. And I think it can happen in a moment. It can happen in a moment. Romans 12 says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. I wonder if there's anyone else in this room that feels like, you know what? I was born to be one of William Wallace's men. I was made for the kilt. I was made for the cape. It's very easy 
It's instinctual. It almost feels righteous that every day I should wake up and think about my kryptonite. Jesus came to put on the cape. Every day you have a choice in your life. Every day you go to the closet and there's a hanger over here that has a cape hanging from it. It represents your purpose. And you can put that on in spite of who you are. Or over here in the corner of your closet is this little box that has kryptonite on it. Human instinct is, oh, I have kryptonite. I can't wear the cape. As soon as I get rid of the kryptonite, then I'll get my cape. I want you to make a proclamation today before God. I want you to stand before God today. And I want you to sense God putting the cape around your neck. The person who thinks, as soon as I change this kryptonite, then I'll wear my cape and live my life. You will never live your life. If you could do that, Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. I want to give you an opportunity today to make a proclamation. I know what it's like because I grew up in the church. Every time I went to church, I felt like I was going there to have my kryptonite exposed. Like that's the job of church. Every time I walked into church, as, even as a kid, I was like, someone's gonna prophesy and they're gonna say, you have this problem. Now I dreaded that. Like I know that this is like, the only goal was to go to church and leave unexposed. It feels like church is the place where your kryptonite is to be exposed. I think church is the place where your purpose is to be exposed. Church is not the place where we come and admit our kryptonite. Church is the place where you have people that make sure you keep your cape on. Because when you pursue your purpose, you have power over your problem. And I bet there's some people in here just like me, maybe for many years, you gave your problem power, not because of how strong it was, but simply how you looked at it. Was there any, is there anyone in this room that inside of you, you're like, I must be one of William Wallace's men. I must wear a cape. I was made for the cape. But for how many years have you said, I don't get to have the cape because of this? Jesus says, you do get to wear the cape because of me. Come on, somebody. Your purpose isn't gone. It's not possible. It's right in front of you. The prison door is open. And so today I want you to declare something. I want you to declare something. We're gonna play a song in just a minute. And when they begin to, when he gets to, to play this song, No Longer Slaves, I want you to stand to your feet as a, as a proclamation as a proclamation that I will wear my cape. It's the message of the gospel, is that I am free. And I don't wear the cape after my problem's gone. I wear the cape now. When that song begins, I want you to stand up. And then I want people of prayer to come up. And just come up, come on up right now, people of prayer. Because I want you to stand to your, I want you to stand to your feet when this song begins. And I want you to go to one of these people. And I want you to say this to them. I want you to say to them, I was made for a purpose. And then I want you to simply say, but my past is holding me back. Don't tell them what it is. It doesn't matter. Just say, I was made for purpose, but my past is holding me back. Or I want you to say, I was made for purpose, but my problem is holding me back. And don't say what your problem was, it doesn't matter. I was made for purpose, but I'm trying to control my life. That's all I want you to say to them. And then you people of prayer, I want you to lay hands on them and just proclaim something over their life. Even just a simple verse, like you are the workmanship of God. In your life, your life will demonstrate the goodness of God. 
And that's it. Like just, just that's it. Before you leave today, I want your life to make a statement of faith that I was made for the cape and I'm going to live with it on. I want my wife to come up here and, off, and, and pray for people. I want my, yeah, over here. Can we just make this a whole thing? Because every single room, every person in this room is a person that's made for the cape. Chris, you're a great cellmate. I want you to come up here and pray for people. I want you to play that song. And when it begins, I want you to stand up declaring that my life was meant for the cape. And I want you to come up and let one of these people make about a 10 second proclamation over their life that God is the author and finisher of their faith. And their life is going to demonstrate the power of God. Okay? There's some people in this room. You didn't come up for prayer, and here's why. You do not think your problem can change. You do not. Can I tell you something? In following God, you don't need to think your problem can change. Walking with God is doing the awkward, the uncomfortable, the unknown. Just like Naaman, when Elisha said, dip in the Jordan River, Naaman's like, that's preposterous. Walking with God is about doing the awkward and the uncomfortable things. And some of you, you're like, you're afraid, you were afraid to come up here and get prayed for because you're afraid, you're afraid to have hope because you're afraid your problem can't change. Listen, you get the faith after you step. The hope comes after you step, not before. The, the, you stay in the prison cell when you say, once I feel like I'm over this problem, once I feel like I know how to fix it. No, you step out of the prison cell when you know you can't fix it. You can step out of the prison cell when you think there's no way it can be changed. I promise you there's probably a couple in this room. You're married and you're like, I, there, there is no hope for us. So I'm not going to get prayed for about something there is no hope with. There is hope. Jesus in the business, is in the business of resurrecting marriages. And all you do is do the awkward thing. You just the awkward thing. I know there's some people in this room and you don't even have to come get prayed for right now. I'm not, I'm not leading you to that. I am saying, to, I do want to say to you, there's probably four to six people in this room. You're like, no, my problem can't get fixed. So just stop talking about this. I will, I refuse. I know what it's like to have a problem for a lifetime and think it can't change. I'm telling you, there is not just hope for your problem to change, but there is hope for you to live the life that's beyond what you ever thought you would live. Because, can I tell you something? God's not that interested in changing your problem. He's interested in setting you free to use you for his purpose in this world. God doesn't even see your problem as that big of a deal. How you think about it's a big deal. He'd like for you to be set free about how you think about your problem so you can think about how he wants to use you in this world. Your problem is not a very big deal. What God wants to do in your life is a really big deal. A really big deal. We come to Jesus says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. You got that problem you're thinking you get rid of? And we think going to Jesus is like going to the principal's office. He's going to be like, so how long have you had the script tonight? going to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, you come to him and he's holding a cape and he says, this belongs to you. And he puts it on. When you put on the cape of purpose, you have power to live out your life on purpose and to deal with the junk of the problem. And facing the problem becomes fun. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to look preposterous. Doing burpees and lunges or anything. Nothing my body does looks very good. You know what? I don't care. I wasn't born for skinny. I was born for freedom. 
Fill in the blank with your problem. You weren't born to not have that problem. You were born to have freedom, which changes the problem. I want to give you something this morning. It took me 30 years to make a video course on how to change. Most of the years was like 28 years of struggle. And then I made this video course called How to Change. And I want to give it to you. If you put up on the screen, all you need to do is text the word change to the number on the screen. And I want you to have this course. It's a 10 day journey, one, one thing a day, and it's gonna give you assignments and stuff to do. But if you simply text the word change to that number, you're gonna get the link to the course and the coupon code. You're not paying anything for it. And you're not entering a sales thing with me. I'm just giving you this and I'm walking away from your life. I don't need you to know me, I need you to know freedom. I want you to experience the change in your life. But this morning, I feel like I opened up a can of worms. And some of you are like, yes, you did. Like, can we just talk about Jesus and not the change that needs to happen in me? Like, sorry. I want you to have freedom so you live out your purpose. If you text that word to that number, I'm just going to send you the link to the course and the coupon code for free. It can, it'll really help you, I promise. Thank you for having me. You guys are a blessing, Pastor. Pastor.